This is my hands for word prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for being in your presence. Thank you for these, your children, have come out to study tonight as we continue our lesson through the book of Leviticus. Heavenly Father, bless those who wanted to come but could not make it and open up our spiritual understanding that we may receive your word, place it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Leviticus 12 and 13 uh, deal with subjects about diseases. And God was showing Israel in chapter 12 and 13 how to keep themselves pure from diseases. But we're going to look at the spiritual side of that. And that's why I love this book so much. We're going to look at the spiritual side of how to keep ourselves clean from spiritual diseases, right? They, they, God allowed them to stay away from physical diseases. We're going to stay away from spiritual diseases, right? So as I'm going to give you a little introduction before we start reading, chapter 12, uh, when we look deep into these verses, we will see that these verses deal with relationship problems, how to help, help us solve relationship problems, how to have a, uh, a better relationship with God, and how to just have a better relationship with other people. That's what these verses, this, this chapter, in chapter 13, 12 or 13, will do. Just like leprosy, when it afflicts someone, we can afflict someone with our words, right? We, we can do a lot of damage just with words alone by itself. And just like leprosy did, did a lot of physical damage to the physical body, our words can do a lot of spiritual damage to a lot of people. That's what we're going to understand. So really the disease we're going to be talking about as we contrast between leprosy, physical leprosy, we're going to call it spiritual leprosy. That's what, that's what we're going to contrast between physical uh, leprosy and spiritual leprosy. So spiritual leprosy blocks our awareness of the damages we cause to ourselves and others. Yes, spiritual leprosy blocks our awareness. Number four, uh, yes, God wants us to be physically healthy uh, as much as we can to our own effort, but even... More so, he wants you to be spiritually healthy. That's the number one thing, right? To be more spiritually healthy. You know, you can do whatever you can to try to be physically healthy, but you can only go so far with that, right? So, but God, you know, you can go real further with spiritual health than with physical health. So, I have seven points. We have seven points. Like I said, we may not get to all of them tonight. That's okay. We'll just carry on for next week. So, let's start with point number one. And point number one is childbirth purification and sacrifice. Childbirth, purification, and sacrifice. That's point number one we're going to talk about. That's the first five verses of chapter five, chapter uh, 12. First five verses. Now, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. As I told you, when we read passages like this, I want you to get a clear understanding right up front. So I'm going to read the first five verses of chapter 12. And it's going to deal with childbirth, it's going to deal with purification, and it's going to deal with sacrifice. And this is what it says, and I'll say each verse so you can follow along. Uh, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, in verse 2, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If a woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days just as she is unclean during her menstrual period. Verse 3, on the eighth day, the boy's foreskin must be circumcised. Verse 4, after waiting 33 days, she will be purified from the bleeding of childbirth. During this time of purification, she must not touch anything that is set apart as holy. And she must not enter the sanctuary until her time of purification is over. Verse 5, if a woman gives birth to a daughter, she will be ceremonially unclean for two weeks, just as she is unclean during her menstrual period. After waiting 66 days, she will be purified from the bleeding of childbirth. 
So what is all this about? Like, what is this purification of after having children? So there was a waiting period that women had to wait before they can go back to church, right, in the sanctuary after they had a baby. For the if they had a boy, the, the days, what would you say, 33 days? And if it was a girl, 66 days. Then they go back to church. Was, that was the whole waiting period. They called it the purification period after they had a child. So your question may be, what is all this about? Then notice he talked about uh, circumcising the boy on the eighth day. If you have a boy, you got to circumcise him. All this is planned by God. So let's talk about this. What does it mean to us spiritually? That's what they did physically in Israel. They probably still do that today. Those who are religious, the religious Jews, probably still follow this purification as well. You know, we used to say, I think we used to get, maybe we got this from this. Uh, we used to tell people, uh, young women, not to bring their babies out after they had a baby. Remember, we used to say that? Look, I've seen girls nowadays, they had that baby one day, they outside next week with the baby. The next day. The next day. Take her, I, it's in the wintertime too. We're like, wait a minute, cover the baby up. You just had the baby five when days I old. Had my first one. <laughs> you was out there, like you said. When I had my first baby, I went, when I went back to the doctor, I said, okay, so when can I go outside? You're <laughs> me out crazy. You got to wait. Huh? I said, they said I can't go out for six weeks. He said, didn't you go out when you left the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> didn't you go out to come to the doctor's right. office? That's your time, right there. <laughs> Stay in the house. But and, and, <laughs> now, I don't know if we did that because of this, um, but Israel did it because God called for purification for women to stay inside, nowhere not to go uh, to church or just stay. It was just a, a purification period. Uh, the symbolism is different. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So this passage is painting the picture. Here's the picture that's trying to paint. That we are all born in sin. The waiting period of having that woman stay inside with the baby and having, we're going to talk about this, they had to give a sacrifice as well, a blood sacrifice after they had children. You know, you, we're going to find that out too. But this is a reminder. The, pur the purification period is a reminder. It was supposed to remind the woman and the man, the husband, that we, every child that's born is born in sin. All of us. We are a part of a fallen race. The human race is fallen. God wanted them to sit back for 33 days if it's a boy or 66 days if it's a girl to remind themselves that this child was born in sin. So not only that, did they have to sit back and wait before they can go back to church, is this, they also had to give a sacrifice when they had children. They had, they had it. We're going to talk about that too in a minute. Why? So some people believe, watch this, some people believe that when children are born, they are all born innocent. Anybody ever read that in the scripture that when a child is born, it's born innocent? It's not in the Bible. So we, everybody is born, we are all born in sin. What's the innocent part we talking about? Maybe see we got the innocent definition wrong. So what innocence should we be talking about when we talk about a child born in innocence? It's not sin. It's that they don't know. Right. They, they don't know. know. It's right. the consciousness yeah. of a child yeah. that they don't know. They are not aware that they are born in sin. Right. They, they haven't, we call the age of accountability. We used to say, uh, it's 12 years old. No, some kids know what they're doing at five, <laughs> six. <laughs> two. Two, right, two. So whenever that, that, that consciousness of awareness of a child, you know, we say that, that before that, that that child is innocent. So no children or no person was ever born in innocent but Jesus Christ himself. He was the only one born innocent. He was, only, he was the only one born without sin. All of us, our children, grandchildren, everybody, all of us was born in sin, right? So how many of us know that when, you know, some people say this too, if a child was born innocent, just leave them alone, let them grow up, they're going to stay innocent. No, that don't work either. Because <laughs> we start seeing, as soon as that baby starts growing up, as soon as that child starts growing, they get involved into the sinful nature that's on the inside of them. You don't have to teach them. It's automatically in them, isn't it? You don't have to teach your kid how to lie. They're going to lie. You don't have to teach them. 
You don't have to teach them how to steal, kill. You don't have to teach them how to do anything wrong. If they get involved in it, it's because they got involved in their sinful nature, right? That's what we have to, we have to understand this. So we have to understand this about children. Our children need our guidance from birth all the way until they leave your house. They need your guidance. They need you to teach them right from wrong. You have to set rules in your house. You got to set standards in your house because they're children. And this I can understand. Uh, Ari Vernon was preaching on this Sunday. He said, uh, you know, you got a mega church in Ohio. So he said he could understand that uh, he saw all these young people coming to the church and they had babies and things like that. And so he asked a couple of the mothers, hey, you know, we have a children's church over here for your kids. And they can go over there while you can come. He said, she said to him, they don't want to go. Mm. He said, what would you, what you say? <laughs> They got a choice. The, your five-year-old got a choice of weight. So you got kids in your house to tell you at six to seven years old, I won't go to church today. So he said he couldn't understand that. I can't understand it because you know when we grew up, everybody in the house went to church whether you wanted to go or not. You're going to church. That was the standard in the house. So you can stay, if you were 16, you couldn't stay at home. Tell me you're gonna stay at home because you didn't want to go to church. You decide you don't want to go. He said, if I'm paying the bills in this house and the light bills and I'm feeding you, you going to church with me. He couldn't understand that. So now we have created this atmosphere where children at six or seven telling you what to do. <laughs> telling parents, no, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. He said, okay, I'm not gonna force you. Listen. <laughs> What are your standards in your house? What are your standards of living? You're supposed to be teaching that. Your kids need it. Because guess what? They're going to get it somewhere else. Somebody else is going to teach them some standards that you may not like. It's not going to agree with your standards. So therefore, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that's funny because um, I've heard people say, I've witnessed to some relatives, well, I'm going I'm to let my, why don't y'all don't come to me? Bring me bring sound, bring it, whatever. And they say, well, look, I'm, I'm gonna let him make up his own mind, make up wait, wait till he comes to his conscience if he wants to go. I don't want to force him on him. And I thought about it, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So when he's five years old and it's time to go to school, you're gonna say right. the same thing. <laughs> right. no, you're, gonna, you're gonna make sure that boy go to school. Yes. And, and you need that as Christian education more than you did in the uh, uh, world education. That's a good point. Yeah, we don't, you know, you don't make them uh, decide no. if they're gonna go to school or not, or do we? I just, look, I, 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 I almost said his name. I ain't gonna get him in trouble like that. Yes, but What's yes. What's the parent's uh, uh, point of, like if a child fight like five, between five and 12 before they could join a church because they said they didn't know what they were doing? Or, I wasn't usually 12 years old. It was usually 12. Like, I know in the Jewish community, 12 years old is, is when the boys and the boys have their bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. right? They are considered, watch this, at 12 grown. Now in our community, we don't determine that. I've never been to a Baptist church that at 12 did anything special for all 12 year olds uh, or said this is the age of accountability because I've seen kids get baptized at five and six and seven. I've seen them get baptized at three. So uh, we never put a stipulation on age. Yes. The Lutheran faith baptized they do infant Baptism, baptism. Like Catholic churches do. Yes, yes, yes. 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 they believe yeah. that yeah. once baptized, you're, once, they want their children baptized, so because we're all born as sin and shaped in iniquity. So mm -hmm. you are baptized now, you are saved. Because okay, so that's what they believe about yes. uh, baptism is the salvation. Yes. But salvation is in baptism. But we know that's wrong because right. that kid has to do what? Make they, they have to make the choice. They have to accept it. They have to accept it. If you two months, <laughs> you don't even know. Oh, you baptized me when I was two months, so I'm all, I'm good, right, with the Lord. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm good. No, you, you, the whole denomination believes this. They believe that they're saved at uh, birth or at uh, their Christianity. Mm -hmm. They believe that when the priest, I got a couple Catholic people at my job, they believe that at, when they were Christian at six months to a year old, that they were saved right then and there. That was how that salvation for them. So their idea of doing whatever they want to do is there. So, you know, I'm all, I'm all good with the Lord because I was Christian. I was already, I, mean, I was baptized. They think baptism saved them. And we already know this is not right. So, God had Israel do this purification. 
so they could remember that they were born in sin, shaped into iniquity, and do what? And remember that it's God blessing them, and you got to raise your ch children right, and you got to teach them right from wrong. This is a standard that God wanted all the Israelites to remember. So why is the time period for female babies, uh, if a woman had a female child, longer waiting period than it is for a male child? Why is it that she has to stay in the house for 66 days if she has a girl, and she only got to stay in the house 33 days if she have a boy? Why is that in Israel? Well, she was, she was, she was, uh, she was tricked by the devil. She was, she was tricked. So the woman was deceived. Deceived. Yeah, she was deceived by Satan, and the man wasn't. Right. right? So God had. And, his, and Timothy talks about this too. It's in the New Testament as well about a woman's cover. God has made special preferences for women to have this longer period of purification to also remember that they were what? They were deceived in the garden by, by Satan himself. And that maybe that time period of understanding, uh, staying home longer for the girl, not for the boy, but for the girl that she needs what? She needs longer time and covering, and we should spend more time actually teaching our young ladies that they need that covering and they need help from, if they get married from their husbands as well. But that was just a remembrance of Eve being alone by herself and doing what? Listening to the devil. Instead of doing what? What, is she, what was she supposed to do? She was supposed to go find him. Well, he was, the Bible said he was standing right there. He went too far away when she when she was being deceived. He could have stopped it right then and there. Once again, that's why he is held accountable. The man is held accountable for sin. Did you know that uh, when Eve ate the fruit, nothing happened? But when Adam ate the fruit, then their eyes were open. It didn't say their eyes were open when she ate. Their eyes were open when he ate. Because he ate what? Willfully. She ain't under deception. He was supposed to stop her and say, no, remember, you know, I, I've been here maybe a couple of years longer than you, and I told you when, after God created you, and after I got, got, you know, got over looking at you every day, I told you, <laughs> the Lord said, <laughs> we cannot eat of that tree. And you went right back. He could have did all that, but he didn't. He did what she did. He just took the fruit, and he ate what she ate, and that's when sin entered the world. So there's a scripture also in Timothy that talks about the woman having a covering because she had been deceived. So this is another passage of scriptures that say, wait a minute, we should not leave, number one, one another alone in the first place. We're, so all, we're always supposed to look after one another so we can't be deceived by the devil. So the next time, the next thing he did, God wanted them to actually have a sacrifice, right? They had to bring a sacrifice after they had kids. I don't know if you ever remember that. They had to bring a sacrifice. Why? Because guess what? Every time a human being is born in this world, God wanted them to remember that in order for them to be right with him, something else got to die. So all of us are human beings. Jesus is our substitute. He died for all of our sins, right? So God wanted them to remember that, that they needed to substitute for their death. And they had, even at birth, God wanted them to remember that at birth you need to start teaching your children, listen, we got to do these blood sacrifices if we want to be close to God. That's what he wanted them to remember. And he wants to remember from the time your child is born that they're born in sin. And you need to have a sacrifice because the only way that your child is going to be connected to me is if you teach that child that they have to ask for forgiveness and they have to do these blood sacrifices. That's the Israelite. What does that mean for us? Same thing. Why aren't we dedicating our children to the Lord? How come we don't, now we, some people would dedicate, to have these baby dedications, but does it really mean anything? Because I don't see them anymore. You bring the baby, the godparents come, the grandparents come, the parents come, we pray over the baby, and they don't see the baby no more. And I say right there when I do the Christian, listen, 
that when we have godparents up here, we got everybody. Listen, if the parents don't bring them, then grandmama, you bring them. If grandmama, you don't bring them, then godparents, you bring them. We say that nobody, so nobody wants to take the responsibility of bringing their kids to church. Nobody. If your daughter don't want to do it, then you do it. Grandma, auntie, uncle, we have to do it. If you have, if they, if they express that desire, especially your children, say, hey, you know, come get my kids. You know, I know you can't get them every Sunday, but can you come get my kids a couple of times to take them? They, they, they do that for you. As a matter of fact, when we were coming up, my mother didn't go to church. She sent us to church. My grandmother came and got us. All the way till we were five or six years old. And then my, we would tell my mother all the time how we had a good time at church. She started going. So I think my brother got saved first. And she saw his baptism. And he was, what, seven or eight when he got baptized first. So after that, she joined and she gave her life to the Lord. Amen. And she never turned back since. Isn't that something? Now that's how it should work sometimes. Even if your kids don't go to church, don't mean you can't take those grandkids or nieces or nephews and bring them so they can be exposed to the Word of God. Because that's all you're doing. You're exposing them to the Word of God. So let's look at verse 6 through 8. 6 through 8 says this. So he talked about the, he already talked about the substitution and things like that. But watch what he says 6 through 8. When the time of purification is completed for either a son or a daughter, the woman must bring a one, here's the sacrifice, the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a purification offering. She must bring her offering to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. Verse 7, the priest will then present them to the Lord to purify her, not the baby. To purify who? Mama. Not the child, right? Remember, you dedicated the child. So then she will begin ceremony. Then she will be ceremonially clean again after her bleeding at childbirth. These are the instructions for a woman after the birth of a son or a daughter. Look at verse 8. If a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb, she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One will be for the burnt offering and the other for the purification offering. The priest will sacrifice them to purify her and she will be ceremonially clean. Remember, all of this is done just for a remembrance. For them, Israelites, to remember that they have sinned and they always got to keep God in mind that it, it is God all the time that's cleansing us. This, that's what these sacrifices and purifications were for. Uh, if you don't think that they continue with that, that's in the book of Leviticus. Uh, you don't have to turn to it right now. Luke says in chapter 2, let's talk about Mary's purification. Mary did. She went through this process. This is what it says. This is verse 21 through 24. This is Mary, Jesus' mother. Eight days later, Jesus was eight days old. When the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering. So they, they kept that up. Mary and Joseph went to the temple for her purification offering required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, the law of the Lord says, if a woman first child, if her, if her first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. Verse 24, so they offered the sacrifice required to the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves and two pigeons. Now, I think they uh, they were very poor, so I think they brought the pigeons. I think uh, either the two turtle doves were poor. That was a poor person's offering right there that they gave. So now we know that Jesus, now, so somebody might ask this question, well, why are they offering uh, a sacrifice for Jesus? He never seen. It wasn't for him. <laughs> right. It wasn't for the baby. It was for the parent. So the parent can remember, you brought this child in this world, God allowed you to, but guess what came along with the child? The sin nature. So now you got to teach this child that they need to come to the Lord for forgiveness of their sins. 
You got to teach your child that it was Jesus Christ. This is what we have to do. Teach our children that it's Jesus Christ that made a way for us to get into heaven. He gave his life. We have to teach that. I, I never thought, ever since I had my kids, I never thought that, never, I never looked at my kids as if they were never going to grow up. I always had in my mind that my children were going to be adults. So I started real early with them. Ever since they could talk, okay, come on, we're going to start teaching you how to pray. Come on, let's go. Uh, Jasmine, she, she can tell you, she had to learn a Bible verse almost every week. While I was teaching her her words, like we was going to her English words. So I, I worked, the job that I worked was a midnight job. So I was able to take my kids to school. So by the time they got to uh, uh, fourth, first grade, second grade, third grade, I'm driving. Jasmine school, okay Jasmine, pull out your words, pull out your English words, so we're going over English verse, our spelling bee words, I said, okay, now you done with that, okay, and what's the Bible verse for this week? <laughs> She's still talking about that today. She said, the kids were always amazed at me that I knew more Bible verses than them. <laughs> I said, well, that's because we started at an early age, trying to get you to understand, and I knew that my kids didn't understand at that young age, but I knew that they were going to grow into it. I knew that one day they will understand. So you can't look at their age and say, he too young to start. No, they never too young. Because if they're young enough to play a video game and beat that game before they're four years old, they're young enough to learn some Bible verses. They can do it. These kids, I'm telling you, they're smart. They're some smart kids. So watch this. So it wasn't for Jesus. It was for the parents. Today, we identify with Jesus Christ as our substitute sacrifice. So we need to keep that lesson to all our children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. So and here's another good thing the book talked about. Why did they uh, circumcise on the eighth day? What was so special about the eighth day? Why that the baby boy had to be circumcised on the eighth day? We know that eighth day represents a new beginning, right? But that wasn't a reason. Did you know the doctors say that on the eighth day that a boy is alive, that the blood clotting system in our bodies is at, the, at its highest point on the eighth day. So when they cut him, he can, they, when they cut the foreskin, it, he won't bleed to death. The clotting will begin right then and there. And God, God do that. So he said on the eighth day, I want y'all to circumcise on the eighth day. Not the seventh day, not the sixth day, the eighth day. That's an amazing thing that God had all that planned out, even for a baby boy being circumcised. Point number two. Uh, point number two we bring out, in, now that was chapter 12. That was chapter 12. We're done with chapter 12. Chapter 13 now. Point number two in chapter 13, the detection of diseases. Diseases. So I told you. Uh, God even had a system for Israel that he, could, he wanted them to stay away from all kinds of diseases. So he probably, God designed a way where the priest will examine people that thought they had some kind of rash or anything happening on their body. It was the priest that, that looked at them. And the priest determined whether they had the disease, and if they did, they were considered unclean. If they didn't, if he couldn't tell for right, right at the beginning, he would put them in quarantine for seven days. We're about to read that right now. So this chapter, chapter 13, is a picture. Watch this. You should always remember this. Chapter 13 is a picture that once you get saved, you still going to sin. Once you get saved, you're going to still sin. Once you meet Jesus, you still may get a skin disease. You may get an infection. You may get something spiritually on your body, just like Israel. Israel was clean, but sometimes they got caught up into some diseases, right? And we have to understand that once we get saved, just because you have a relationship with God, it doesn't remove something in you. Because you got saved, something did not leave your body. What was it? Sin. Okay, so let me ask you a question. What part of you is saved then? If my body not saved, what is saved in me? Spirit. Your spirit is saved. My mind not saved? So my mind not saved, and my body is not saved. It's because the Bible says that my mind I'm supposed to renew every day. And my body going to catch up with my spirit when I die. 
No time before that. So there's three things you know you need to know about sin. I said this before. Let's see if you can remember. Here's three things that you need to know about sin. Number one, God saved you from the power of sin. When you got saved, he saved you from the power of sin, meaning this, that sin should not control you because you're supposed to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's one. The second thing, God saved you from the penalty of sin when you got saved. What's the penalty of sin? Hell. You have to pay for it. Right. So you don't have to pay. You don't have to go to heaven and pay for your sins because God did it for you through his son. You accepted him by faith, so now, okay, so now you don't have to go to hell. That was the penalty for sin. Now you don't have to walk in sin because you have the Holy Spirit to help you through that. But there's one thing that you got to remember about sin, and it's the third thing. Uh, you won't be saved from the presence of sin until you die. So what we have to live with is the presence of sin until we die. Sin is in us and is around us. We see people involved in sin. We get involved in sin. So this chapter, chapter 13, is a picture. The diseases, the disease of leprosy is a picture of the spiritual leprosy that Christians are involved in. You know, we used to sing that song, you know, when I got saved, my hands looked new. When I got saved, my feet did too. Now y'all know good and well, your hands didn't look brand new when you got saved. <laughs> and your feet didn't look brand new. Nothing physically changed about you when you got saved. Nothing. So, so what changed was the person on the inside. That person was redeemed. Now watch this. So nothing about you changed, but we need to know that it was God in this chapter going to teach us how to stay away from spiritual sin. This is what this chapter is going to teach us today. So, you know, after we accept Christ, we need to understand it, that we do sin. We do fall short sometimes after you made Jesus your Savior. So I don't know why... We have this idea in our churches that once we meet Jesus, sin has left somewhere. Because we still see it in the church. Folks arguing, fighting in the church. The pastor or musician people in high leadership got kids out of wedlock. Divorces happen in the church. Did you know the divorce rate is just as high in the church as it is in the world? Almost all 50% of all marriages in the church end in divorce after the first two years of marriage. In the church. So sin must got it. Sin is still in the church. So we can't say, and I, this is cross denomination, cross religions. I don't care what tribe religion you say you were part of, guess what? Sin is still in every human being. We have to learn how to control it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a first example. So let's talk about anger for an example. Some people can control their anger, but some people can't. I'm talking about Christian. We talk about Christian folks. Some people uh, can control their flesh in certain areas, and some people haven't learned how to do it yet. Christian folks. So when this pastor, you already know his name, he, he got called, uh, he got divorced, he had a baby out of the way, like while he was married to his wife. Very known pop popular preacher. He's still come on TV right now. If I told you his name, you'll know. You know what he said? He said one day in an interview, somebody interviewed him about uh, divorcing his wife uh, because of his adultery. He said, well, God knew that Reverend so-and-so was going to have a problem with his flesh when he made me. That's what he said. That was his excuse. So he made an excuse for his sin instead of saying, I am immature in my spirituality. That's what he should have said. I haven't learned how to control my flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit, even though I got 20,000 members. Because your membership don't Determine how spiritual your leader is. Uh, I'll tell you another pastor who died in, in the hotel from a drug overdose. He had 20,000 members too. I'll tell you about another pastor who, who uh, had, five, had five kids and a wife at home. He was sleeping with another man in the hotel and the man got tired of him to lie down the church. So he went to the news and told everybody he had 20,000 members. So guess what? Don't look at the membership. Don't look, oh, he, he's such a good guy. He got 20,000. The Lord on his side. He need to pray for God, just to pray to God just like you do. We go through it. All of us follow and go through sin and trying to control our flesh like everybody else. 
that's why we need to talk about this chapter. It's a very uh, wonderful chapter. Look at the first eight verses. Watch this. It talks about disease, and then we're going to talk about spiritual disease. First eight verses of Leviticus. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, if any, verse 2, if anyone has a swelling or a rash or a discolored skin that might develop into a serious skin disease, that person must be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to the one of, or one of his sons. Verse 3, the priest will examine the affected area of the skin. If the hair in the affected area has turned white and the problem appears to be more than skin deep, it is a serious skin disease and the priest who examines it must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. Verse 4, but if the affected area of the skin is only white, discoloration and does not appear, appear to be more than skin deep and if the hair on the spot has not turned white the priest will quarantine the person for seven days verse 5 on the seventh day the priest will make another examination and if he finds that the affected area has not changed and the problem has not spread on the skin the priest will quarantine the person for seven more days verse 6 on the seventh day, the priest will make another examination. If he finds the affected area has faded and has not spread, the priest will pronounce the person ceremonially clean. It was only a rash. The person's clothing must be washed and the person will be ceremonially clean. Verse seven, but if the rash continues to spread after the person has been examined by the priest and has been pronounced clean, the infected person must return to be examined again. Last verse, verse 8, if the priest finds that the rash has spread, he must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean, for it is indeed a skin disease. So the main point I want you to understand, the main point he's trying to get you to understand is, is this point, is that there is a disease called leprosy. King James Version called it leprosy. That's what it's called. Uh, NIV version, other versions call it a skin disease. And we're going to call it a skin disease. We can use it interchangeably. So the person will be examined to see if they had symptoms of this disease. And if they did, they would be quarantined for seven days, right? Then they would come back and examine them again. If he still wasn't clean, he'll, he'll let him uh, be quarantined for another seven days. Then after that, he will determine whether or not the person had the disease or not. My question to you, first question is, what is the meaning of seven days? Why seven days? Why not ten days? Why not five days? Seven is complete. Seven is the number of perfection, yes. So God says, well, in that determination, uh, in that seven days, maybe he could determine if the person has a full-blown disease or not. And notice, if he wasn't sure, he'll send that person back into quarantine for another seven days. But by the time on the 14th day, the priest will know if that disease or that rash, was it a full-blown leprosy or was it just a rash? And he'll know. And they will decide whether or not to call them clean or unclean. So guess what? There is a spiritual disease that can be to take contagious in the spiritual church. Did you know that? That spiritual disease is called, spirit, let's call it spiritual leprosy. It's a skin disease. It's a disease that, that you don't see, you see it on top of the skin, but it can go either deeper under the skin. So we're talking about this disease that affects your attitude in the church. Bad attitude is a disease, right? Holding resentment in your heart is spiritual disease. Holding grudges in your heart, you are carrying a spiritual disease. So these spiritual diseases must be detected, watch this, by the priest. Who, who are the priests today? We are the priests. Remember, for the past 11 chapters, we've learned that we are the priests. You don't believe it? Go to 1 Peter, which says this. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So what is he really saying? If we are the priest, and it was, it was the priest that was doing the examination, I need to go to my brother and sister who are the priest to be examined. In other words, uh, one of the passage scriptures says this, go to one another and bear one another's what? Thoughts. 
I should be able to find a Christian, that's a priest, because all of us are priests if you're saved, and confide in them. And they're supposed to give me some advice. They're supposed to be an exam. They're supposed to examine. I'm supposed to be able to examine them. They're supposed to be able to examine me. They're examining my behavior. They're examining, uh, am I on the right road? They're going to give me some advice. Elon, you're going down the wrong road. You off track. And I should get an attitude because my brother telling me that I'm doing something wrong. Right. Because that's my brother. Right? And he's the priest. And if I'm a priest, then I'll be able to tell him that we're talking to one another at the same time. That's the problem with the church, isn't it? That's the problem right there. We don't even want to talk to each other. We'll talk to each other about somebody else's problem, but we don't want to talk to each other about our own problem. We'll talk and gossip about somebody else, what they're going through, but we don't want to gossip about what we're going through. And another reason, here's another reason why I think Christians don't talk to each other. We think that if I tell my brother or my sister my business, my personal business, somehow, some way, it's going to get out there. The pastor going to preach on it next time. <laughs> That's what we think. See, we don't trust each other. We don't trust each other. If this is my brother, why would I spread my brother's business in the street? That's my brother. Right? And now if you if you got your own family member, especially if you have a large family and you got some you know you got some things going on in your own personal family, you're not going around telling everybody about your own sister and your own brother. Why would you do that spiritually to your brother, your spiritual brother or sister? If they came to you in confidence, you're supposed to pray with them and guide them. So the disease really is we don't trust each other to confide in one another, but the scripture says we have to. We have to talk to each other because we have to hold each other accountable for our own actions on this planet as we represent Jesus Christ. Who are we to tell another born again believer, oh, I'm, I'm going to stay out of it, you know, that's, that's him. I, I know, I saw him messing with that other lady, the other lady, and you saw more than seeing him. And you said, you ain't going to say nothing. And he preached last Sunday. And you still ain't going to say nothing. And then when they all come out and watch, see, I knew about it. You knew about it. Two years ago, I knew about it. And you didn't say nothing. That is amazing to me. No, you need to be a part of one another's life. Therefore, we need each other in the kingdom. We need each other. We need each other. We need to talk to each other. We need to confide in one another. I always already, you know, I told you that joke over and over again about the three preachers. <laughs> They wanted to say that they, people always come to them and confide in them and tell them about their faults and their sins. And they said, we don't have nobody to talk to. We don't have nobody to go to to tell our sins and problems. And they said, well, we're going to get together and talk about our own sins and our own problems. So these three preachers got together and they started talking. To, the first preacher said, listen, I got a problem with stealing the money in the church. <laughs> So the other two preachers said, listen, okay, we're going to pray for you, Reverend. This one, you're going to get together. We're going to pray. They pray for him. So the second preacher said, well, I got a problem. I, I lust in the church. I'm lusting in the church. And they said, okay, preacher, we're going to pray for you. And then the third preacher said, well, you know what? I, I got a gossiping problem. I sure can't wait to get out of here today. <laughs> That's what we think. We think somebody's going to tell all. In the street, where we're supposed to trust one another. We do. We're supposed to really go there. So the picture is that the priest inspected the Israelites. We have to inspect one another. Not in a judging way, because if I'm confiding in you and you confiding in me, we're not judging one another. Did you know sometimes we can't see our own faults that other people can see? So when you're talking to one another, you can see something in them that they may not realize that they're seeing. Yes. And I'm glad you brought that up. I was talking to someone the other day and they were they were saying that they uh, they don't go to church because all you know they tell all they, they, they talk to people and their business being told and then so you have to decide you have to watch people and watch the way they walk and you know their fruit and the way that they walk in the Lord and if you see somebody it don't mean that you can't confide with nobody in the church <laughs> right. there's somebody in there that you, that you can talk to but you mm -hmm. have to you have to discern mm -hmm. who that person is yes. and then mm -hmm. that's the person you don't go to every single person you in the don't. church yeah, you, know. you gotta you find that mature Christian you have to Find that, one. that you know that it's not going to spread your business. Right? Right. You do. You you really do. It's a it's a process that you have to watch out for. Another thing that these priests did, notice what they did. They took their time when they expected the Israelites. Seven days went by. Another seven days. Watch this. 
uh, we're supposed to be slow to what? Anger. No, you're, you're quick to listen and slow to speak, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak. So when you're confiding into one another, you're trying to give somebody some advice, listen first. Be that listener. They may, that's all they probably wanted you to do is just listen. I just need somebody to listen to me. That's all. I just want somebody that I can talk to and just get something off my chest. And if that's all they wanted you to do for that moment, then that's all you do. They didn't tell you to say, you set up a meeting with them. Now you come see me every Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> So I can give you some spiritual advice. They didn't tell you to do all that. They just wanted you to listen at that one moment. At that one time, I need a brother or a sister that will listen to me. Point number four is this. Let's talk about the point number three. These four symptoms. He mentioned four symptoms to show if a person had uh, leprosy. Let's talk about these four symptoms. Uh, starting at verse 9 through 11. And it says this. And verse 9 through 11, anyone who develops a serious skin disease must go to the priest for an examination. Verse 10, if the priest finds a white swelling or on the skin and some hair on the spot has turned white and there is an open sore in the affected area, verse 11, it is a chronic skin disease and the priest must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. In such cases, the person need not be quarantined for it is obvious that the skin is defiled by the disease. So the priest was to examine any spot on the person. Here's another thing. If the priest was able to examine any part of your body and see if you had any disease, that means you had to be vulnerable. So we got to be vulnerable to one another as far as we got to be transparent. Don't try to hide anything. If you're going to say something, say it. If you're going to tell what your sin is, just tell, tell the person what it is. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to sugarcoat it. It is what it is. This is what I've done or this is what I've said. How can you help me? If you were just going to pray with me, that's good, but I need some help. So the first sign, the first sign that a person has a skin disease and leprosy was swelling, right? That's the first sign. The swelling means this, that the problem, when you see swelling in the skin, the problem is, is more than the skin. It's under the skin. That's, you know, that's nine times out of ten with any sickness or disease. If you see something swelling up on your body, uh, that problem is a little deeper than that skin that you're looking at, right? And so it's more than skin, skin, it's under skin deep. So what's the spiritual lesson? People swell spiritually in pride, don't they? So that's a sign too. When you see a lot of swelling in Christians, <laughs> they got a problem. <laughs> what can they swell? Oh, they can swell in pride, conceitedness, right? They can swell in anger. So when you see Christians all swelling up and getting all agitated and, and all upset over something, they swelling up and get, they have a problem. You just exposed yourself because you can't even get control of your anger. You're showing us that there is a deeper problem. Why is it that, that if that person says one thing to you, that person can get you to go off, but the other people can't. You're showing there must be some kind of resentment toward that person. There must be some kind of hatred, some kind of something going on on the inside of why you can't control your anger when you're around certain people. You just gotta say something. You just gotta get upset. That shows that you've been affected by that spiritual disease called leprosy. So any type of spiritual swelling means that there is an irritation in your human spirit. And if you don't believe that that is true, Jesus said this, write it down, Mark 7, verse 20 through 22. This is what Mark Jesus said. Jesus says, Mark 7, verse 20 through 22. This is Jesus talking about what's on the inside of your heart. He says this, and then he added, it is what comes from inside the man that defiles him. Not what comes, not what's on the outside, right? It was, this was on the inside. Verse 21, for from within, out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. <laughs> he said, all this comes from your heart. Now, don't come from the outside. It comes from, from the inside. So we can't say, once again, you're already born in sin. I already know one of these things is a, a part of you. 
you, you can't say all of these things are a part of you. We know that. But this is not the only list. It says, one passage of scripture says, and the like. Anything connected to these things that's like these things, we are supposed to stay away from. But they all come from the heart in the first place. So when you see the swelling up of these things in people, especially Christians, you know they haven't uh, got their bodies under control by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the problem. It's the second symptom. That was the first symptom was swelling. What's the second? The second symptom that you have a spiritual disease was if your hair turned white. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> right? So in the swelling, the second stage of this disease being in the swelling of the, the affected area, it actually destroyed the hair because the hair turning white means what? So you, you said it means you're getting old. But old leads to what? Death. When your hair turns white, it's showing that that hair follicle has died. That's why you're losing the color of your hair. That's, that, that's what everybody says. I don't want to look in the mirror now and remind myself <laughs> that I'll be leaving here. You know. But some people have, I have, I have uh, white hair since I was uh, 25 years old. They call it premature gray. So my hair was turning gray when I was, I was 25. So I always kept my hair cut real short. <laughs> so, always. Because I didn't I wasn't exposed by gray hairs. It was a lot. At 25, I had a lot. So notice this. When he says the hair turning white represents death, it represents that they were leading to death. What does that represent spiritually? It means this. If you get caught up into any type of spiritual uh, immaturity, it's going to lead to death. You're not going to die right away because some people have white hair, like I said, for 60 years. It don't mean you're going to die the next day because your hair turned white. Right? You can live to be 150 and your hair still white. But it means you're on your way. So people get caught up into all these sins, if they don't turn around, if they don't fix it, they're on their way to death. And that's what we got to start telling them. That's the lesson they need to know. Look at uh, uh, letting uh, anger last, letting bitterness last. Let's look at symptom number three. So the first symptom was swelling. Second symptom was the white, the hair turned white in the swelling. And then here's the third one. The third uh, symptom was raw flesh. If that affected area on your body was raw, then you know you had a serious disease problem, right? So these were, the raw area were sores that would not heal. And you know, you heard of those kind of sores that people have on their body that sometimes boils, things like that, that it, it, they just won't heal. So this, what is the raw flesh represent spiritually? Uh, write this down, you know this passage of scripture. I'm gonna read it to you, but you write it down, Galatians. Chapter 5, verse, and we're going to stop with this one. We've got to pick it up next week, but check Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to just read this passage. You already going to know what it's going to say. Chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. This is the raw flesh. This is the raw flesh. Watch this, verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your raw flesh, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, Lustful pleasures, verse 20, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, verse 21, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Notice that other sins like these. Because, you know, uh, when he says other sins like these, what other sins that is not listed in this Bible that are just like these? We live in the 21st century. So people say, well, my sin I mentioned in the Bible. Yes, it is. Well, and your sin could be surfing the net. So you're going to start a relationship with somebody on the Internet. Uh, that's not godly. Because you don't have no kind of relationship if you're married. Right? Outside of marriage. Right, so you can't, so all this modern technology that allow us to indulge in different sins, that's a part of uh, verse 21, envy, drunkenness, wild heart, and other sins like these. Just in case I miss what Paul is saying, right? And then he says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice, he says, let me tell you again, if anybody is living 
this type of life. Not falling every now and then into one of these sins. Don't, you're talking about people living these lifestyles. I'm like, yeah, I love Jesus, but I got three wives. Okay, yeah, no. <laughs> you, you, you haven't changed nothing about you. Your life is supposed to be changed by the word of God. And if you, if you haven't changed, you haven't changed. So we're going to talk about that before we go to point number four next week as we go further. So we're going to continue studying chapter 12 and chapter 13 of the book of Leviticus. Do you have any comments, any questions about the same diseases, yes. What was point two? Point two. I think point two was. Swelling one here. Here. No. Well, no. The point two. Yeah, the point. She was talking about the. Not the uh, let me go back. Yeah, point one was. Point three was the four symptoms. Let me go back. Go on back. Point three. What was point one? Was it the detections of diseases? Point one was yeah. childbirth. I thought it was childbirth and Yes, childbirth purification. Point two was the detection. Somebody said the detection of disease, which starts chapter 13. Yeah. The detection of the disease. Remember, we're using the same outline from the book. So if you get lost, just go to the chapter in the book and I, I took the outline directly from the book so it's the actual the same so remember we'll finish we'll try to finish chapter 13 next week and then go on to chapter 14 as well how I many of you learned something tonight about staying pure and holy before the lord amen let us bow our hands for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for being in your presence. Thank you for allowing us to study one more time about being pure. We, we want to stay away from these spiritual diseases. We want to stay away from spiritual leprosy, spiritual anger, spiritual everything. We don't want to be affected by anything that's going to pull us away from the love and joy of Jesus Christ. Thank you for these. Your children are here. Thank you for their diligence in studying God's word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.